The Crown of Stones, Magic Price by C.L. Schneider Prologue Bodies pressed in on me on all sides. More were piled up beneath my feet. The grass gorged with assorted fluids and trampled remains squished under my boots as I carved open my opponent's chest, pushed him aside, and moved on to the next. There was always a next. The Langorians were a swarm, an inexhaustible, savage, mindless swarm, and we had no choice but to become like them to survive, to become animals, going at each other, mechanically pushing against the tide, battering whatever stood in our way with whatever we had. Clubs, axes, swords, knives, our bruised, bleeding, bare hands. Fighting for days, months, years, striving to hold out against an enemy that knew nothing of mercy, an enemy stronger and far more brutal than us, we'd become something less than we were. And we were still losing. I grabbed the queen's arm and steered her out of the fray. We can't take much more of this! Needing to be heard, I drew her close. We should pull back! Pull back! Queen Elagar Arcana yanked herself free. She gave me a wild, defiant look, full of passion and reckless resolve. It made her exotic features come alive. My orders stand! We press on, Troy, as always. I shook my head. Our numbers are dwindling too fast. We can't win this! We can and we will. Elagar raised a hand. She touched my face, and the sound of metal clashing and men screaming seemed to fade away, brushing back the blood-spattered white strands that had come loose for my braid. She ran a finger down the strong line of my jaw. Trust me, love. The Langorians will not have Rayla. How can you still believe that? Because I must. Because I have faith. Ayla, I stopped myself. Then I started again. I saw the messenger arrive from Cabri. I know he carried orders from the king. You can't keep ignoring them. I can, and I will. She dropped her hand and backed up. My husband is a fool. I don't care how many messengers he dispatches from his throne. He is not out here. The blood of these men baits my skin, not his. This is my war, Troy. Mine, she cried. We fight, we die. We go on until we prevail by my command. I will not surrender. That is the way of it. That is only the way. My throat went dry at the fire in her. The way she stood, outlined by the backdrop of chaos, flanked by the crackling flames that consumed our camp with sweat beating on our dark skin and battle less glazing our stare. I wanted to pull her into my arms. I wanted to go back to this morning on the furs of her tent when Elagar's flawless ebony skin was on me, where status and race didn't matter and death felt far away. Mostly I wanted to believe her, as I had so many times, that every battle brought us closer to victory, that persistence was our greatest strength and it would carry us through. But this was it. King Draken of Langor was throwing everything he had at us, making one final push to wipe us all out. To once and for all lay claim to the land of his forefathers had sought and failed to conquer. Surrendering was unacceptable. She was right in that. Yet Elagar had lost her way. Somewhere along the line, the outcome had stopped mattering to her as much as the fight and my affection, my awe of her, had blinded me for far too long. Give me the order, I demanded. Let me shift the odds. Her dismissal was quick. No! We can't keep going like this, sword by sword, day after day, until there's none of us left. Let me cast hell down on these black-hearted bastards. I've given you my answer, and it was no different than the last hundred times. I moved closer. You know what I can do. My magic can give us an advantage the Ligorians can't match. We can stop fucking this never-ending war, Ayla. We can stop it together with steel and magic if you'll just... You are Shinri, Shri hissed. Your kind are meant to do as they are told. Yet after six years in the ranks, you still push for something that I will never bend to. Then you're as big a fool as the king. Her hand that, only a moment ago, had caressed me, struck my face. My husband forced your service in this army upon us both. And from day one, when you stood in my tent, a young man, eager to please, drooling with the urge to cast, I made it plain that this conflict would not be solved with magic. It's dishonorable. I don't trust it. I forbid it. Now you are my best soldier. I've given you free reign in my bed, but not here out here. Not in battle, ever. Is that clear? Staring at her, my heart went cold. I don't think I can do this anymore. Fighting is half a man. Ashamed of what I am because you say it's wrong. I'm not just a soldier. I held up the sword in my hand. I called to the stones embedded in the leather wrapped handle and they began to glow. Their vibrations pressed in through my skin, down into my veins, and the uncertainty washed away. I am a Shinri soldier! Put that magic away, she scolded. Do you want to kill us all? I can control it. Can you? Her eyes were harsh. 
Can you promise that when your spell steals the strength that needs to be born, that it won't steal from one of my men? That it won't steal from me? Your magic is a disease, Ian. Your need for it, your addiction, clouds your judgment. It threatens us and all undermines all my orders. Your orders, I roared, contradict my duty to keep Rella safe. I've tried to pretend they didn't. I've tried to be what you wanted, but I can't. I am Shinriela. I am magic. And if you don't untie my hands, we will all die here today. Stunned, Elagar looked at me. For a moment, there was a rare vulnerability in her eyes, a kind of resigned sadness. Then she raised her sword, turned, and rejoined the battle. She left me standing alone on the rim of the conflict, watching with a crushing sense of finality that, as the men I fought besides for years, were being slaughtered. I can save them, I thought, though they wouldn't do the same for me. A magic user granted exemption from slavery that kept my mind in check. I was tolerated at best, but lately I'd seen it in their eyes next to the pain, the hunger and exhaustion. They no longer hated me because I might use magic and bring them harm. They hated me for not using it, for continuing to let them die. Frustration pushed a scream from my lungs. A pang of rage and resentment sped through me so sharp that I pulled my second sword, pushed into the mayhem, and started swinging. I sliced through bodies one after the other, trying to lose myself in the rhythm. I pressed forward, deeper into the madness, wrath blazing in my white eyes as I strived for an answer to the conflict that burned inside me. My magic knew nothing of sides. My spells fed without discrimination. They were selfless and heartless. They didn't care who was right or wrong, who was strong or weak. To create themselves, they would drain friendless as easily as foe. In the villages, they called me a champion. But I wasn't. I was a weapon. Somehow I'd forgotten that. I looked around me at the dogged rel and soldiers fighting for their realm at the spirited Aurelian warriors of Elagar's homeland, and I made my decision. I sent the magic back into the stones on my sword. Not here, I thought. The cost is too great. I had to get out in the open. Going against Elagar's wishes had been, was bad enough. I couldn't risk catching her army in the crossfire. Spying an opening, I started making my way off the field when the ground began to shake. In seconds it was undulating with such force that none of us could stand. It was inconvenient, but it was no surprise. Miraculin was a fidgety continent that didn't stand still for long, and having fought for years in the worst of it, the disputed quake-plagued region between Rayla and Langar, it was understood that the land would quiver when it pleased. After, we would all get up and resume the battle. But today, something was different. The trembling wasn't stopping, and the ground wasn't just cracking. It was rupturing, not in slender, minute fractures as in time past, but in long, jagged canyons that ripped across the field, dissecting the valley, in deep chasms that opened without warning, swallowing fifty men at a time and spewing plumes of ancient dust high into the air. Hillsides were sliding away. Overhanging cliffs broke off and tumbled down. The entire landscape was being violently rearranged. Watching, lying prone on the heaving, blood-soaked ground, coughing up the debris in my lungs as panic broke out on both sides, I thought I should get up. I still had a sword in each hand. Enemies were all around me. I should attack now while the ground is still shaking, before they recover. But even as the land continued to buckle and roll, my attention had shifted away from the quake in the battle to the crooked crevice opening up alongside me and the object buried within it. About halfway down one wall, partially obscured by a layer of dirt, was a curved row of fused colored stones, glowing softly in an array of shades. The stones, sapphire, spinel, diamond, ruby, obsidian, were pulsing, emanating a vibration that was definitely magic, yet its tone was unfamiliar. It was pungent, so sweet and alluring that I couldn't look away. Sliding one of the swords into the sheath on my back, I scooted closer. The edge of the rift crumbled some of my weight, but I didn't waver. Buried in this very spot was the once sprawling empire of my Shinri ancestors, a fallen realm lost and unseen by the worlds for over five hundred years. Whatever artifact the quake had uncovered was worth the risk. I reached down inside the hole. My fingers brushed the round lift, and an immediate intense current of energy licked my skin. It ran through me, and I let out a yelp. It wasn't from pain, though. The jolt was one of pure pleasure. It was raw and acute, and I quickly wrapped my entire hand around the thing and held on. Nine distinct magical vibrations were alive inside it. I could feel them all swirling and overlapping. Each had their own well of energy, but together they formed a compilation of searing, pulsing power that was vast beyond any magic I had ever experienced before. It was massive, concentrated, enthralled. 
I abandoned my other sword and started digging. Loosening the soil, I tugged on the artifact, and it didn't take long for the dirt wall to collapse and my prize to come free. As I lifted it out of the hole, I shook it clean, fashioned like a cane's crown. The circlet was pure perfection. The others, the soldiers around me, wouldn't see it that way. They couldn't feel its magic, couldn't taste it. They had no idea the pleasure it could offer, yet simply looking at the stone crown opened a familiar, sinking, retching pit of need in my gut. Sweat beaded them, poured off my skin. Tremors erupted deep inside me, rivaling those that split the valley floor. I was suddenly so empty, so hungry. Try! I heard my name, but I didn't turn. It was Elagar, and I didn't want her to see me like this. Try! She shouted again. The urgency in her voice tore at me. Elagar was queen. She was my commander and my lover. The ground had settled all across the field. Weary bodies were rising up, raising their weapons to resume the killing. She could be in trouble. But as I stared at the ring of vibrating colored stones in my grip, I knew what I had. And I realized I had no choice but to betray her. The answer is here. It's in my hand. In this crown of stones. It's always been in me. She was just too headstrong to see it. Once more, Eligar called to me. This time, I tore my eyes away and found her. She was close and fighting her way closer. Trails of blood streaked her skin and clothes. But I could tell by the way she was moving that none of it was hers. I can't let this go. Good men are dying for her stubbornness. I have to make her understand. Convince her that I can end this. Make her see that I were fighting on a borrowed time. That if it wasn't for me, would have died a long time ago. She'd be furious, I thought. If I admitted that my spells had been sustaining the men, bolstering their endurance, tightening their arm and heightening their senses, so long they had no idea to their own limits anymore, she would never forgive me. But there are so few of us left now. She has to realize that magic is the only way. Elagar spun to block and attack from the rear, pushing the men away. She caught sight of me. She gave me a brief smile. Her eyes were fierce and confident, and for just a moment, I felt better. Then the sword point burst through her left shoulder. Another pierced her chest. Elagar went down, and anguish consumed the last of my doubt. Pain obliterated the hope she had given me. Consequence and reason bowed in the face of my so much fury. As I looked down at the stone crown in my hand, I had one coherent, desperate thought. This ends now.